cannabis had a breakout 2020. Legal sales across the U.S. hit a record $17.5 billion, a 46% increase from 2019, according to a new report published by BDSA, a cannabis sales data platform. 14 states allow for adult cannabis use, while 36 allow for medical sales. Most of the sales growth came from adult use markets, especially mature markets like Colorado, where sales grew by 26% to reach $2.2 billion. Oregon saw sales hit $1.1 billion, a 29% increase over 2019. Emerging markets like Illinois, which expanded its medical cannabis market to include adult use sales last year, saw a rise of $784 million. This was the largest dollar gain in the U.S., and Illinois is currently doing more than $1 billion in sales. California, the country's largest cannabis economy at $3.5 billion, increased sales by $586 million, while Florida saw an increase of $473 million. According to experts at BDSA, three things contributed to the industry's growth last year. The COVID-19 pandemic, more customers entering mature markets like California, Colorado, and Oregon, and states like Illinois and Arizona establishing new adult use markets. Another factor driving the industry's growth is a simple one. More people are consuming more cannabis than before. About 30% of consumers surveyed by BDSA said they shop for cannabis products more often, while 25% of consumers say their cannabis usage has increased since before the pandemic. In Colorado, where market penetration is greatest in the country, 48% of Coloradans imbibe. Cannabis delivery companies also made a killing last year as they capitalized on the pandemic. BDSA found that the number of Americans using cannabis delivery increased 25%. But most of the cannabis industry is still in the black market. Illicit cannabis sales are estimated to be more than $100 billion each year, but the legal industry is slowly catching up. By 2026, BDSA predicts the legal U.S. cannabis market will reach $41 billion in annual sales, roughly the size of the craft beer industry. Charles Koch is one of the richest people in the world. And depending on whom you ask, he's a titan of industry, a dark money political boogeyman, or the philosopher king of the libertarian movement. And although Koch isn't big on consuming cannabis himself, he's now going public with a long held belief. Cannabis should be legal nationwide. And so he's putting his name and nearly $25 million of his $45 billion fortune to influence criminal justice reform and cannabis legalization by the end of 2021. Charles Koch is also a political influencer. And right now he's being thought of as the person who might be able to span both sides of the aisle and convince politicians to legalize cannabis on the federal level. The criminal justice reform has been a big issue for Charles Koch and the Koch Network. You know, starting in 2015, he asked his longtime general counsel at Koch Industries, Mark Holden, to basically start a campaign to um, kind of bring about a lot of reform in, in criminal justice. You know, and that was kind of like the beginning of the Strange Bedfellows arrangement where somebody like Charles Koch and President Obama, you'd never think they'd agree on anything, but um, in criminal justice reform, they really found common ground. Cannabis prohibition was kind of the next step. Marijuana has been effectively outlawed in America since 1937. 37 states have legalized medical use, and 70% of Americans now believe that cannabis should be federally legal. Charles Koch has a, a very libertarian view when it comes to, to marijuana. He sees cannabis prohibition as a basic infringement on personal freedom, but he also sees it as a destructive public policy, uh, which adds to America's mass incarceration problem. He also thinks like we've learned this lesson before. Uh, we've seen what alcohol prohibition did, uh, which it, it didn't stop people from drinking. Uh, it created more crime because when you criminalize something that is widely used, people don't stop using it. 
in July, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senators Cory Booker and Ron Wyden introduced their long-awaited federal legalization bill. So basically what Schumer's bill does is give the states the rights to legalize or continue the ban, but it lifts the ban federally. So empowering the states to do what they want. That's the definition of states' rights and definition of small government. So framed that way, it's a conservative issue. It would be hard to have a conservative kind of argue that states' rights is, you know, in their their party's philosophy. However, it's unclear whether or not this bill could pass once formally introduced. Schumer readily admits he doesn't yet have the numbers. He needs at least 10 Republican senators and all 50 Democratic senators for it to pass. And another issue is that President Biden does not fully support legalization. You know, Valerie Jarrett, senior advisor to President Obama, told me somebody like Charles Koch could be a, a person who kind of brings both sides together. The people on the right, especially who see Charles Koch coming out on this issue, that moves the line. Uh, what an interesting thing that uh, Randall Meyer, this lobbyist, said is, is that he's talked to over two dozen uh, politicians in, in Congress on the right and left. And he says that Koch has basically given cover to people who were on the fence. You know, what he believes, what he takes stances on really moves the needle. Why he's doing this is really for philosophical beliefs. He's fighting for criminal justice reform because that's something he wants to do. Um, and he has the resources to do it. And this issue of cannabis legalization nicely dovetails into his philosophy around criminal justice reform. The Taliban are known for their ultra-strict interpretation of Islam and harsh legal punishments. But at the same time, they're one of the biggest players in Afghanistan's illegal drug trade. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime estimates over 80% of global opium and heroin supplies are produced in the country. The gross value of Afghan opiate exports is estimated at between $1.5 and $3 billion per year. Joe Pirsanti saw many parts of this trade up close as a special agent with the DEA's FAST teams. He was involved in counter-narcotics operations and raids against the Taliban's heroin production network. It's crazy. I, I can describe it to people, and I've done many times, but until you're really over there, you just can't really get a grasp of it. You just can't believe people are still living like this. It's like the Stone Ages over there. A lot of places there's no running water, they're living with their animals. Um, the labs are very crude, just with like 55 gallon drums and other things like that, but they just make such good quality heroin. Just hitting these locations, or raiding them, they're well behind enemy lines and this is their source of income. So most often than not, they're gonna fight like hell to protect this. During a mission with Afghan counterparts and Australian special forces in 2011, Pirsanti was severely wounded by enemy gunfire as they were trying to leave the area. I was providing covering fire for my teammates to get on the helicopter. Once everybody got on or near the helicopter, me and my teammates, my team later tapped me and said, let's go. I turned left to run on the helicopter and that's when I was struck in the head. Pirsanti was left blind from his injuries and later retired from the DEA. He's now a motivational speaker and professional bodybuilder. He says most of the heroin is smuggled through Iran and Pakistan and ends up in Europe. Only 5 to 10 percent of it reaches the United States. Pirsanti says the Taliban have also expanded into producing hashish and crystal methamphetamine. Depending on the year's harvest, opium accounts for between 6 and 11 percent of Afghanistan's GDP. In 2020, about 224,000 hectares of opium poppies were cultivated. That's the surface area of about 32,000 soccer fields. Vanda Felbab Brown, a senior fellow at Brookings, who has written extensively about Afghanistan's drug trade, says when the Taliban first came to power in the 1990s, they actually tried to ban opium. As it started expanding in the country in 94, uh, it encountered extensive poppy cultivation in the core uh, provinces where the Taliban operated and where it originated, Kandahar and Helmand. And its first impulse for religious reason was to ban poppy cultivation. But it very quickly generated revolts 
uh, even the areas with uh, strongest tribal and other support for the Taliban were all of a sudden opposing the Taliban rule. And so the Taliban quickly uh, realized that trying to suppress poppy was unsustainable. End of 1995, it allowed cultivation to proceed. And soon it realized, well, cultivation is taking place. Why don't we tax it? So by 96, it's, it's taxing opium poppy. Philbab Brown says the Taliban got around the religious contradiction of opium by prohibiting and punishing its use within the country, and that selling it to infidels abroad was another form of jihad. But she says they aren't the only ones in Afghanistan involved in the trade. Warlords, militias, gangs, and even government officials have ties to the poppy. And many farmers and their families depend on it to survive. In 2017, it was estimated poppy cultivation provided up to 590,000 full-time jobs. Felbab Brown says opium is so entrenched in the economy that even if it were possible to completely get rid of it, the spillover effects on the local population would be disastrous. If opium poppy disappeared um, through magic wand, it would be catastrophic economically for the Afghan people and it would be catastrophic um, for any government that was in power. So uh, in this case right now, the Taliban, it would generate great privation, malnutrition, uh, and uh, huge uh, political instability. Now, ironically, we might not be in a situation where poppy disappears, but we might be in a situation where much of the international market disappears. Because uh, a lot of uh, the North American markets uh, have seen uh, heroin, not from Afghanistan, from Latin America, displaced by synthetic opioids from China and India. And so imagine the situation where the Taliban, for international legitimacy reasons or, in, or desire to get uh, economic aid out of Russia, bans poppy for a year or two. And then it decides to lift the ban. Well, it may find that its West European markets are no longer interested in Afghan opium because the opioids now used are synthetic opioids from China and India. Since retaking power in Afghanistan, the Taliban have publicly stated that they would ban drug production. But similar to their pledges to respect human rights and press freedoms, there is a general distrust in the Taliban to follow through. Pirsanti believes, if anything, drug production will simply increase under new Taliban leadership. From all estimates, the last year the production of poppy was way up. And um, everybody believes in all the um, experts believe it's just going to get worse. It's going to explode even more, especially since, you know, we're pulling out and all our coalition partners are pulling out. They're going to go unchecked and just continue to get, you know, millions and billions of dollars to fund their terror networks. To me, it's pretty scary. 420 means a lot of things to different people, but broadly speaking, 420 is the, the unofficial holiday for cannabis. It's also the biggest sales event of the year. The most widely accepted origin story of 420 has its start in 1971 at San Rafael High School in Marin County, California. We've been friends for over 50 years and we used to sit on a wall at San Rafael High School in the middle of uh, the campus and we'd watch people going by and do impressions of them and, and make jokes and try to make each other's laugh. And that's how we became the Waldos from sitting on the wall. One day, um, a friend of a friend brought them a hand-drawn map and said, hey, my brother is a Coast Guard and he planted some, some weed plants. And he said that these guys were growing marijuana. For some reason, they thought that their commanding officer was going to bust them and they didn't want to get busted. So they decided to abandon this growing project. They said, we could pick it. They said that the Coast Guardsman grew a map of where it was and he had the map, he showed me the map. And uh, we decided, hey, let's go pick it. We all looked at it and he told us what the story was and all of us were gonna to get together, meet at 420, and search for these uh, hidden plants. They set the time at 420 p.m. They would meet at this statue and uh, on campus, uh, light a joint, jump in the car, and go you know, on an adventure trying to look for these plants. Uh, so it went on for several weeks, and they never found them, but um, they did coin the term 420. We could say 420 is our secret code in front of our parents 
cops, teachers, everybody. And nobody knew what it was, and it was our little private joke. And it spread to the wider circle of friends that we had. It spread to our younger brothers. It sped, spread to their classmates. So it started going from class to class to class. It started going through generation. You go to college, and your college buddies, they pick it up, and they're from all over the United States. My brother Patrick was, had, was good friends with Phil Lesh, the bassist from the Grateful Dead, for 50 years. Now, Phil asked my brother, Pat, if he'd like to manage a couple of uh, side bands while their dead were taking some time off. So I worked with them uh, touring around California, doing shows, and uh, I was backstage smoking with, with Phil Lesh and guys like David Crosby and uh, Terry Haggerty and a host of other musicians. And we, Patrick, my brother, and I were spreading 420 backstage and then it kind of filtered through the uh, uh you know the roadies and the people that were hanging out and that spread throughout the dead community and that after that the up. entire world you know with the proliferation of state legalization i feel like we forget that like in the 90s marijuana was was not okay really the term 420 is a vestige of the past like of drug suppression of you know anti-drug psas perhaps the biggest irony of the, this whole cultural phenomenon is that what started as a joke between a couple of stones teenagers has blossomed into the biggest sales event of the industry this year the legal cannabis industry, um, you know, which is across 17 states for adult use and over 30 states for medical, is going to bring in $20 billion in sales. What's special this year is that it's the 50th anniversary of uh, the Waldos coining the term 420. And there's only three states that have not amended their marijuana laws. So when you think about it on that level, the tipping point is here. The latest uh, Gallup poll put it at 68% of Americans want marijuana to be legal or, or at least feel that it should be legal. In the 70s, you know, that same stat was like, you know, around 15%. It's been 50 years of uh, the creation of 420, but it's been over 50 years of our friendship. And that's the most important thing that we have going here is that we're still all alive and pretty much healthy and uh, we're still friends. We want to celebrate our friendship and the uh, spirit of 420 of uh, friendship, humor, and kindness. In 2016, recreational marijuana became legal in California, creating a dynamic new industry in the Golden State. But since marijuana is not fully legal at the federal level, this has created a new gray area when California cannabis products are sold in states that don't have full legalization. Elliot Lewis, the CEO of Catalyst Cannabis Company, is hoping to bring more awareness to this problem through a recent lawsuit he filed against the California Department of Cannabis Control. The lawsuit alleges people are gaming California's system and diverting untold millions of pounds of legally grown cannabis to the illicit market across the U.S. It claims California's industry regulators are fully aware of this, but not doing anything about it. Here's where the main issue lies, according to the lawsuit. Phony straw man operations, known as burner distributors, will purchase cannabis from a legitimate grower. They'll pay state cultivation taxes, but not the required state excise taxes. Burners will then sell the legal cannabis on the illicit market, either within the state for prices that legal dispensaries can't compete with, or out of state. Under legalization, this should not be happening, since state regulators should be using the track and trace system designed to prevent this type of problem. But the lawsuit alleges regulators are satisfied with collecting cultivation taxes and simply don't pursue action against burner distributors. Instead, the state only investigates people who are reported by others and have made the purposeful decision to turn a blind eye to illegal burner distros in order to keep that excess cultivation tax money flowing. And the state does collect plenty in taxes. In 2020, more than $1.1 billion was brought in from the legal cannabis industry and it's on track to exceed $1.27 billion in 2021. However, the lawsuit does not seek monetary damages. Instead, it is seeking a court injunction that would compel the state to shut down the alleged illegal cannabis distribution network. While the allegations are confined to California's system and the requirement for distribution permits, the problem of burner distributors has the potential to gain national attention if more states decide to fully legalize.
You might have heard of a website called OnlyFans over the last year or so. OnlyFans is one of the most exciting tech companies in the world. OnlyFans allowed the content creators to set the price and gave them a generous 80% stake for every dollar they made. There's also a generous tipping system as well. OnlyFans just became the single groundswell for a lot of adult performers, a lot of the industry, in the same way that businesses like Zoom became a part of our meeting culture, in the same way as payment businesses like Stripe. OnlyFans just became huge during the pandemic. People crave intimacy, people crave connections with people, and OnlyFans delivered that. OnlyFans delivered it well. OnlyFans has just found a completely new audience of people who are willing to pay money for access to models, uh, adult performers, but also chefs and celebrities. They're keen not to be known as an adult site or a porn site. They don't like those words. I'm just kidding, that is not the kind of content you're gonna see from me. With these celebrities jumping aboard, there is a genuine move away from adult entertainment and pornography towards being a social media site that just allows famous people to monetize on the content they already create, they already give away on Twitter and Instagram. And that's a new market. So OnlyFans was founded in 2016 by members of the Stokely family, an Essex-based family here in the UK. Tim Stokely is very much the face of OnlyFans. He's the CEO, he is the person who gives statements. He is uh, thoroughly believable as the face behind OnlyFans. Behind the scenes, you've got Guy Stokely. Now, he's a kind of old school City of London, a retired banker. He worked at Barclays in his time. He's the authority figure behind OnlyFans. The, the majority owner of OnlyFans is Leonid Rudvinsky, a 39-year-old Florida-based tech entrepreneur. Rudvinsky is actually one of the richest men in porn ever. Neither Larry Flint nor Hugh Hefner were ever Forbes billionaires. We know he was born in Ukraine, he moved to the US, and he studied economics at Northwestern University. Before OnlyFans, Rudvinsky was most famous for My Free Cams, a cam service that was live action for adult performers. What we know about Leonid Rudvinsky is scarce. My colleague came to me and said, hey, we've got this new billionaire. And, you know, we, we don't really know anything about this guy. So I do the obvious thing, like, you know, Google them so I can start looking at his more benign looking ones. Then there are his other known websites, his porn websites. Uh, my hunch was, and it turned out to be a right hunch, was that when Leo was a lot younger, maybe he was a bit more careless than he is today. I also have um, a couple of tools that I can use to start looking at their internet footprint. This brings back like a thousand results. There are these other sort of really strange websites and they're essentially, um, they all have a um, password or passes or something like that in, in, in the name. They're essentially promising lists and lists and lists of passwords for paid for websites. I suspect he never actually really hacked into websites or illegally uh, retrieved them. Partly because his own company in a court document said the way we make money essentially is is these porn sites for whom we offer free access to, they actually pay us money every time they get a click. But there was something else which, which was much more concerning and, and a lot more eye-catching, which was um, some of these password sites were offering logins to what were described as um, underage pornography. Um, even some referencing uh, models um, under the age of you know, 10, 11 in some cases. Um, so pretty gruesome stuff. He knew that paedophiles were out there and he knew he could make money from them by getting them to click. And when they did click, they didn't get that illegal content they were after. They uh, just got taken through either to other password sites on illegal content. That seemed to be the nature of his business. And this was happening sort of from the late 1990s to the mid 2000s. In the mid-2000s, Radvinsky caught onto the craze for leaked celebrity sex tapes, even if they didn't exist. He registered sites for Ben Affleck, Jennifer Lopez and Britney Spears. He did this because the websites would still drive traffic, whether or not there was any tape on there. 
this is quite funny because OnlyFans, its whole thing is you have to pay to get this content. Um, and we're going to pay these porn stars and these celebrities a fair amount. He was essentially saying, you know, back then, I'm going to give you free access to these porn sites. And, and so they're not going to get your money, but you'll still get their content. And the fact that you have a majority owner who back in the day, A, has run, you know, these big amateur porn sites was once, you know, courting the attention of pedophiles, essentially, even though he wasn't giving them content. I, I think that really has to affect, you know, what happens when the IPO still a lot of stuff we don't know about him. He's still a bit of a mysterious figure. Isn't it grand to be able to have a legitimate drink after all these years? It certainly is. How? I believe this is Prohibition 2.0. We've seen this movie before, so it's a comfortable feeling to understand how big the industry is going to go from here and how we want to position ourselves for it. Ben Kovler is the founder and CEO of Green Thumb Industries, which is one of the nation's largest cannabis companies. Ben Kovler is an heir to the Jim Beam fortune. His great-grandfather became president of Jim Beam Distilling Company in the 30s after Prohibition ended. Transforming a business from the illegal market to a legal one is in Kovler's blood, although he's the first in his family to do it in the cannabis industry. Learning the Beam story growing up, my grandfather taught me a ton about branding and the consumer and how to think about that. One of the lessons we learned early was, you know, square bottle, square shake. It's kind of a fun thing to say, but part of the brand being square bottle, square shake, this is an honest delivery. And just that nuance of, oh my God, the shape of a glass bottle of the booze actually matters to the consumer, to the brand. I think you see a commonality amongst our brands of a simple idea and a simple promise. Uh, we try to focus on that. For example, dog walkers, uh, which we invented in-house, is a mini joint suitable for a dog walk. There's an element of a uh, charitable component to more dog shelters and treating animals humanely. It's easy to understand that. We talk about enjoy the journey which is obviously, you know, life is the journey, not the destination. And so trying to remind folks of that, maybe if they're on their dog walk or just having a walk uh, and a joint is a good thing for that walk. So the highest level, it's a product that consumers want, so they're finding a way to get it. So let's take bathtub gin and moonshine, the equivalent of the illegal product, uh, have become Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, Jose Cuervo. And we believe weed in a baggie will become rhythm, Bebo, Incredibles. As New York prepares to launch adult use sales in 2023, Green Thumb Industries is expanding its cultivation in the state with a brand new 200,000 square foot facility about an hour away from Manhattan. This particular plot of land has been witness to more than a century of America's changing views on drugs and crime. In 1912, it was home to the New York City Farm, which was an early drug and alcohol treatment center. In the 30s, it was the New York State Training School for Boys, a reform school dedicated to rehabilitating troubled youth from the city. And by the 70s, it had been converted into the Mid-Orange Correctional Facility, a state-run prison. And the irony that cannabis will be grown on this particular plot of land is not lost on anyone. We really think it's a full circle moment for the industry. We're going to take a place and a site that used to lock up people for cannabis. And now we're going to employ them to produce cannabis. Today, the legal cannabis industry is worth about $20 billion. And that's dwarfed by the illicit market, which is worth over $100 billion. Right now, currently, cannabis is federally illegal. So states throughout the years, starting with California in 1996, have slowly passed state laws that allow for certain legal markets. Medical marijuana is legal in some form or another in about 40 states. Some states only allow for the use of CBD. Others allow for wide access to all types of cannabis products to treat all kinds of conditions. It's an industry with a lot of nuance. There are some pretty significant changes on the horizon, though. For 2021, the Senate is now in the control of Democrats, and Democrats are very motivated to change federal law. So timeline of when cannabis could be legalized on the federal level, it's, it's still up in the air, but um, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. The cannabis industry is growing. While the industry used to be mostly made up of mom and pop shops, the biggest players are now public companies with multi-billion dollar market caps. This transformation makes sense, especially if you realize how much the legal industry has grown in the last few years. Since 2014, the cannabis industry has grown from $3.4 billion in global sales to about $20 billion last year. 
current estimates put legal cannabis sales at more than $40 billion by 2024. Bo Wrigley is part of one of America's classic business dynasties, the Wrigley family. His great grandfather and his namesake, William Wrigley, started the William Wrigley Company in the late 1800s. Uh, he started as a soap company. Very quickly, he pivoted to chewing gum. Bo's father worked and ran the company until the day he died, literally in March 1999. And Bo took it over when he was 35. And he ran it until 2008. He sold the company to the Mars family for $23 billion. After he sold the family company, he became an investor and he has a bunch of different investments in healthcare and that kind of thing. What's interesting about Bo is cannabis was never part of his life. He didn't grow up smoking marijuana. One day, the managing director of Bo's private equity group came up to him and kind of nervously started asking like, hey, Bo, what do you think about cannabis? And he said, I have thoughts about it and definitely not interested. But that said, him and his managing director kind of talked it out and thought about it. It's like, okay, well, I actually don't know much about it, so let's figure it out. Wrigley realized what he thought he knew about cannabis was wrong. He started to see it was a burgeoning industry that had been unfairly hamstrung by law and politics. He saw the change in consumer behavior. Over 60% of Americans are now in favor of legalization and the applications in healthcare as a great opportunity. Bo realized that people use cannabis for all different reasons. You know, people use it to relax, but also there are legitimate medical uses. So he started looking at it seriously and him and his managing director started doing research and they identified one company, Sertera Wellness, which is in Florida, and they took a plane down to the cultivation site, which is outside of Tampa. This is the first time he's seen one marijuana plant, let alone a, an entire grow facility full of them. He ended up leading a $65 million investment round into the company. And about a year later, he took over as CEO. A little bit after that, they changed the name to Parallel. Forbes estimates Parallel makes around $200 million a year in revenue and that the company is worth at least $2 billion. With an investor like Bo and a bunch of other high net worth individuals, they're in a pretty interesting position right now. He told me that he tried to smoke a joint once, didn't really work. He's not a smoker. So coming to this investment, he, he actually smoked pot once in his life. While Wrigley doesn't smoke cannabis, he does enjoy his own products. One of his favorite ways is they have this nano emulsified product. It's basically like a hyper concentrated form that's in a little dropper and you put some in a drink. So his go to form of consumption is to put a couple drops in a, in a LaCroix. Parallel has several brands that sell to a wide variety of consumers. From Gen Z to baby boomers, Parallel has products for all of their customers, vaporizers, edibles, mints and drops. They even struck a licensing deal with singer and entrepreneur Jimmy Buffett. Parallel is also looking to develop THCV, which has the same euphoric effects as THC, the main psychoactive compound in cannabis, but it is an appetite suppressant. It would give you the, the euphoric feeling without the, the urge to, to eat. Wrigley wants to use cannabis to improve sleep as well. Kind of what Bo envisions is a product that he calls kind of an ambient killer. Um, this is not an FDA approved product, but it would be something over the counter that could assist you in terms of, of a sleep aid. Bo Wrigley is really the classic executive, if you will. He ran his family's company and sold it in one of the deals of a lifetime. And if you were to ask when he sold the family company, you know, is Bo Wrigley going to get into marijuana, the answer would definitely be no. But as you get to know him, he is a very thoughtful and visionary person. So he will approach something with his own inherent ideas and biases like anybody will, but he is of the mind to kind of challenge those assumptions. Just the fact that Wrigley is in the industry helped change how people perceive the cannabis industry.